Greetings again from Abu Dhabi uh, and the Fortune Global Forum. I'm joined uh, by Jeff Roberts, crypto editor of Fortune. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Paula. Crypto, uh, it's a journey. It's, uh, it's been more than 10 years now with us, uh, mm -hmm. a new asset class. What's your feel? How is this evolving? And uh, a short comment on the history of crypto. Short comment on the history of crypto. Um, well, I've covered it for more than 10 years. It started in uh, 2009, and I guess what I should say is how radically different it is now. Yes, there's a lot of scandals, but in the early days, it was people who did it to escape the government. It was Bitcoin was created as a protest against inflation. The very first block of Bitcoin has got a, uh, a copy of a newspaper article about the British uh, uh, exchequer printing too much money, and Bitcoin is supposed to be a way to get away from that. Radical libertarians. Now, fast forward to today, do you know who's into, into Bitcoin or into crypto? BlackRock, Fidelity, mainstream money, and so on. So that's a radical change. Institutional investors came in, yes. validating effectively that it's a technology and not a scam or a SADI sphere, it's become more mainstream. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at it from a distance, it looks like a scam and you'd have a yeah. point. There is a lot of scams in crypto. There always has been scams in crypto, but any new technology will attract scammers. That's just, you know, AI is a hot thing right now. You know, a lot of stuff around AI is a scam. Does that mean the technology is a scam? No. So, you know, with crypto and also too, there's a lot more kinds of crypto than there used to be. The first crypto was Bitcoin. Now you've got stable coins, Ethereum, a lot of other stuff. A lot of coins are scams, but the technology is really taking a giant leap forward. So the technology is going to be there. One key question then that comes up from what you, what you just said, which is very accurate is, so we have the cryptocurrencies and the cryptocurrencies are based on a specific technology. As an asset class, it's new. And when you compare it to other liquid asset classes like stocks, one element that maybe is missing, but, or maybe not, and this is where you come in, is can you have a due diligence? So a firm is listed in some weird stock market. Some of your people can go check and deduce through a due diligence whether you should invest in that asset or not, in that stock or in that firm. In crypto, since it's a technology, are we getting closer to understanding how we can assess a cryptocurrency? That's a really good question because crypto talks a bit, big game about freedom, transparency, blockchains. Blockchains are very, are very transparent, but a lot of the people making them are not. Um, and um, I think that's been an issue with crypto because we don't know what's under the hood. We look at um, FTX, the exchange run by Sam Bankman Fried, who's now in prison, that blew up. It's one of the biggest financial scandals in American history. The problem was lack of technology because he wouldn't show what's under the hood. Um, you know, but it, it, it depends what you're looking for for transparency. Some of these blockchains you might hear, you know, go buy Cardano, go buy this, go buy XRP and stuff like that. But a lot of companies aren't really showing what's under the hood. It kind of depends. So I think you're fair to be skeptical. Bitcoin is one exception. Bitcoin is sort of run by no one. But a lot of the other ones, there are sort of people behind it really kind of, you know, I think you want to look carefully and do your due diligence. But you're right, it's hard. You know? Maybe as AI and our comprehension of that dynamic becomes clearer. And since crypto is so much heavily based on blockchain and technologies that are similar to the future of the digital sphere as we see it, maybe the tools of comprehension of what's happening there are also going to be stronger and our capacity to keep up with what's under the hood of crypto could become stronger. Yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, the, the potential for transparency is huge. And the knowledge too, the problem is the people who control the money supply are old. Central bankers are old, nothing wrong with old people. But you know, if you talk to people you know, uh, in their 20s, most of them, especially men, have had some experience. They've bought it, they understand blockchain, they've tried it. Talk to people in their 60s, it's very low. Talk to people in their 70s who you know, are running a lot of the government and the courts and the central banks, they have never tried it. So I think it's a generational thing. Um, you know, crypto still needs to mature because a lot of the information is circulated on social media. And, you know, for goodness sake, do not go to, you know, Twitter to get your investment thesis. You know, you need to be more skeptical. Don't put all your money in it, too. I mean, it is still a very risky asset. Put 5% of your wealth in it. Do not sell your house to put it in crypto. Do not put 50% of your money. Do not put 100% in it. But if you want to, you know, try it out, it has a big high upside. If you put 5% in with a little bit of homework, you could do okay. You know, who knows? And remember, Bitcoin's 13 years old. A lot of the other ones might go away. But, you know, at this point, if Bitcoin was going to go away, it would have by now, I think. So basically, the journey is the cryptos have become more mainstream. They've become more transparent. Our comprehension is up. 
technology is improving, our capacity to follow is changing and maybe strengthening the capability of the investor to follow more closely and have some form of due diligence, maybe stronger one in the future. What do you think that the future holds for crypto? I understand the headman, they're here to stay. What's their capacity in terms of an asset class or use of transaction in your view as in one of the most seasoned uh, crypto editors? Yeah. What do you see? Well, skeptics point out and say, show me why I need this. And crypto has, I think, promised too much and delivered too little. I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, Bitcoin's not very good for payments because it's got a high, you know, transaction cost that go with it. Bitcoin is digital gold. It's a good sort of way. There's, you know, a limited supply of it. Um, like gold, you know, why is gold valuable? I mean, yeah, it's good for making jewelry and it's a good conductor. The main reason gold is valuable is because I can go to Russia, I can go to Greece, I can go to America, I can go to India. China, everyone agrees this shiny gold yellow metal is worth something. Bitcoin increasingly has that quality. You know, anywhere in the world, and there's this sort of common realization, we agree this is a store of value. And it's easier to carry than gold is. Um, the other cryptos, though, that's where so scarcity and ease would be two main assets. Scarcity, exactly. And the and, and the universal ease, use of it, yeah. So, you know, the other stuff you have to get more careful. The thing I think is exciting and interesting right now, two things. One, institutional money moving into crypto. You know, the two, the second biggest crypto after Bitcoin is Ethereum. A lot of interesting stuff going on there, too. It's been a while. It's been quite well proved. But what's happening right now is in the U.S. markets, which are, of course, huge. Crypto is not, you're not allowed to trade it as an ETF, trade it as a stock. That's about to change. Starting in January, you're going to have BlackRock, Fidelity, you know, giant companies like this listing it as a stock. The liquidity is going to get a lot more. So it's going to get more mainstream that way. So that's something to watch. The other big thing to watch is um, stable coins. Do you know what stable coins are? You can tell us. I have an idea, but you can tell us on this live interview for our also viewers to watch. Sure. I mean, I think your viewers probably know finance quite well. They're probably familiar with the pegged currency. You know, there's uh, where we are right now in Abu Dhabi, they peg their currency to the US dollar. Exactly. You know, Argentina in the past is on other countries. Um, what a stablecoin is, you peg a piece of, you know, a, a digital a token, a blockchain asset to, um, you know, the euro or the US dollar. Right. And so one stablecoin is worth one US dollar. Depends who's issuing the stablecoin, of course. You know, there's been, you know, scandals. There's that one called Terra that was backed by like an algorithm and it yeah. blew up. However, the mainstream ones, um, uh, Circles, USDC, they show, you know, they'll show their banking reserves. Like we have the money in the bank, it's backing this. Um, and Tether is the biggest one. People aren't quite sure what's under there, but people seem to accept it's real. And we're talking billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars from stablecoins. And moving that is around is a lot easier. Try to move money from like, I don't know, pick a country, Uruguay to Romania, you know, uh, Canada, even to England. Moving it across borders is a giant pain. Stable coins move in blockchains. The banks don't close 24 seven a way to move money around. And increasingly that's being adopted for payrolls you know, for, uh, you know, for person to person payments for savings. And if you're in a country prone to high inflation, where you're, you know, your savings can get wiped out through inflation, people are increasingly putting it in stable coins. You know, it's just a, a, a fancy way of owning US dollars, but rather than trying to buy, you know, pieces of US dollars, the paper on the black market, you can just buy these things and they'll stay, you know, relatively stable as long as the US is stable. Jeff, game changing developments. I'll close with, uh, let's say, a tricky note, which is that maybe in a way, the fact that firms active in the sphere of crypto can be chastised, that there is, you know, this monitoring and review yeah. and the rule of law in that sphere, maybe it's good news in the end of the day, because as it's part of normalization, the same way that a firm will be fined, a firm in crypto could be fined. And, and that means in a way that the eyes of the regulators are there somehow now. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin was born as as a you know rebel currency and I wanted nothing to do with the government. The world has changed. There still are people like that, but regulation is not a bad thing. You know, it you know it's you know there's a reason we regulate the securities markets. It's just industries grow up, and increasingly, you know, there's this new breed of firms coming along that have accepted regulation from the very beginning. You know, I mean, Coinbase has always done a good job of that, but in the crypto sector, which was proud of being an outlaw category they now they want regulation and that's not a bad thing that's how you protect investors exactly. that's how you get transparency you know and that's how you you know get more information so more mentioning yeah and i mean crypto's reputation is horrible in a lot of places i've covered crypto for 10 years 
half the people it cover are in prison. You know, it tells you something. But, you know, as we get more mature, you're getting responsible actors coming into the space. And a lot of the original people are not bad people. You know, some of them are, but a lot of them are not. So, I mean, be careful. Do your homework. Don't put all your money in it. But I think crypto is a big opportunity. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks so much, Paolo. Good to have Pleasure you. to be here. Thanks so much. Cheers.